Well, hi there, and once again, welcome to Doxedo Headfield Online. It's so great to have you with us. And I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. And we're going to get into it in a minute. But I want to remind us, whether you are a guest or you're one of our partners, that we are in a series where we are wrestling through some of the rhythms that make us who we are. So last week I told you that for us as the Strafeld household, we've got some rhythms that define just who we are as a family. We sing certain songs at certain times, we eat pizza and watch movies at certain times, we practice thankfulness. And as I said, actually we had a couple of days ago a discussion between my wife and I about some of the new rhythms that we want to introduce into our family. And I had this idea, I, I had this vision. And I saw us on Sunday afternoons, late afternoon, we gather all the kids together, we all gather our shoes that need to be cleaned, and we get all this stuff together, and then we sit in a circle on the floor together, we just catch up relationally, and we clean our shoes together. So it's like this family moment, we're teaching them responsibility, and I had this vision, on, and, and I'm saying it, my... <laughs> My wife just looks at me with this face of like, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. So, okay, not every single rhythm is going to be the best. And yet we know there are certain rhythms that just make us who we are. And in this series of the next four weeks that we're calling us, it's the, the Tina, the Runa, the Ons. This is who we are. We want to look at some of those rhythms and invite you into them. And so last week we looked at the most primordial rhythm of all, the ancient rhythm, the cosmic rhythm of God calling people into relationship and then sending them out as his representatives, breathing in the kingdom and breathing it out, creating family that goes on mission. And that's the thing that undergirds everything in the series. It's the great call that every person is invited to. And we summed it up as follows, to live in relationship with God and to live as a representative of God. That is the great call. And today we want to dive into that first one. Double click on it a bit. What does it mean to live in that relational space with God and with his people? Now recently I was at Starbucks here in Midland, Maine. And I was interested by one of these cards that I picked up. Speaking about Starbucks' values, it just plainly said, we create community. And when you work at Starbucks, you can create an environment where neighbors and friends can get together and reconnect while enjoying a great coffee experience. Isn't that interesting? Starbucks don't simply see themselves as this conglomerate of coffee bean goodness. They say we create community. And together with so many other businesses and organizations of recreation and fitness and, and hobbies and, and whatever else, this is the word at the moment that everyone is after, community. Why is that? Why is this so important? Why would even Starbucks deem it necessary? And the reason is because I think modern people have come to the realization that we live around and with so many people and yet we experience life deeply with almost none of them. We live our lives with many people, and yet we experience life with almost no one else. In fact, you can go and do research. It's constantly said that Gen Z and the millennials are the loneliest generations of all. They are what psychologists are constantly calling, you know, the crowded loneliness of what we're experiencing. People around us to the hilt, and yet alone. In fact, there was a study done specifically on relationships, tracking more than 7,000 people over nine years, and it found so interestingly that those who lived in an isolated manner, relation, they were more than three times likely to die and suffer illness than those who were relationally connected. And in fact, they were saying that those who were relationally connected, even if they had bad habits like diet and you know, smoking and drinking too much and all these kinds of things, then compared to those who had great habits of exercise and, and, you know, and, and they had their drinking and they diet down, if they were relationally connected, they would still outlast them on all these measures. So can I just say, if you're in a community group in Hatfield, those people around you are literally keeping you alive. But that's the reality. I love how clinical psychologist Dr. Henry Cloud, he says, a person's ability to love and connect with others lays the foundation for both psychological and physical health. 
This research illustrates that when we are in a loving relationship, a bonded relationship, we are growing. But when we are isolated, we are slowly dying. I think our modern world is more than ever realizing these three key truths. That almost all people find themselves, though surrounded by many, desperately lonely. Secondly, that loneliness is like a cancer. It's a poison to the human animal. And thirdly, and this is so important, that creating lasting community is really difficult. Yes, we have our hobbies that we practice. We go and play touch rugby. We have CrossFit. We do all these things. But guess what? The moment you drop that hobby, you will probably be dropped in a relationship. We've seen it so many times. You have friends for reasons and seasons, but having true community, man, that's difficult. I want to show you how the writer to the Hebrews, he writes mostly to a Jewish Christian audience in the early church. And these guys were really down on art. They were so under pressure that some of them were considering just dropping the faith completely. And listen to how he encourages them about Jesus, what Jesus has done. And look at some of the interesting connections that he forms. So Hebrews 10 verse 12, he says, But this man, Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. In verse 13, And therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, listen to this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Secondly, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. And now, number three, and let us consider one another, in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Man, it's, it's incredible for me in this passage how the writer to the Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so effortlessly makes these connections. He goes from Jesus straight to certain implications of how we are to live. If your life has been radically transformed, not by your works and your religion and your morality, but coming to Jesus saying, I am broken, I'm lost, I'm hopeless, I need you. I have everything or nothing I've ever wanted and yet I'm empty. If I hold on to faith in Christ, in the finished work of what He has done on the cross, the promise of the scripture is, you will be made alive in Jesus. But he says, listen to the connection from that place to the next. He says, number one, Jesus has offered the final and full sacrifice for all sin forever. No one can add to what Jesus has done. And he says, he uses, he uses the word, since that is the truth, listen to these statements. Number one, let us draw near to God with full assurance, he says, with boldness, with cleansed minds. We don't have as Christians to sulk and have kind of rolled shoulders saying, oh God, I know you're so disappointed in me and I'm such a shocker and I'm always, I'm always doing the wrong thing and I'm just not progressing. And I'm... No, he says, yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we're immature at times, but we can come into bold relationship with God because of Jesus. He says, let us do that. Number two, let us, he secondly says, verse 23, hold on what? To what Jesus has done. Don't hold on to your faithfulness. Hold on to his faithfulness. But here's the kicker. Number three, he says in verse 24, let us then what? Consider one another. Isn't that profound? He says because of what Jesus has done, those who put their faith in him, know this, you have bold assurance before God. Hold on to that. Secondly, let us hold on to his performance, not what I can do. But thirdly, if you're in a relationship with God through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, you are immediately connected, not just to God, but to his people. Let us consider one another. Relationship with God drives me straight into relationship with his people. 
Now, I want to show us that there are three elements to this community being brought into relationship with God, the breathing in, the family that will eventually then, yes, go out on mission as we speak about it next week. But look at these three ideas. There's a pattern to our community. I think there's a great potential that we need to really discover. But I think there are also some elements of pain that sometimes keep us from it. So first up, the pattern. Verse 24 says, since we have Christ, let us consider one another. Such an effortless connection. Because of Jesus, the people of Jesus. How can he make that connection? Because it feels so strong. It's not just incidental. It feels like it's part of the design. I think it's because it is. If we look at Christianity alone amongst all the world religions, it makes this claim that God is triune. It's a fancy theological way to say that God in his essence is one, one God eternally expressed in three persons. One in essence, three in person. God is community as the one God. And then now listen with fresh eyes to Genesis 1.26 or ears, not listening with our eyes, of course. God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. The Trinity means that God is community and we are made in the image of God. No wonder the deepest need, the most natural connection is to community. That's why Genesis 2.18 says it's not good for man to be alone. And often we speak about that in the context of marriage, and that's fine. But there's a deeper need than marriage to be like our father, relational, community. What's striking about this statement for me is that this is made, this Genesis 2 statement is made even before the fall, before sin enters into the picture. So in perfect relationship with God, God says we need each other. Because of Christ, let us consider one another. So Dr. Gilbert Belazikian, he's an American author and writer, and he puts it so beautifully. He says, community is deeply grounded in the nature of God. It flows from who God is. And because he is community, he creates community. It is his gift of himself to humans. And therefore, the making of community may not be regarded as an optional decision for Christians. It is a compelling necessity. It's a divine mandate for all believers at all times. This is the pattern of God's nature that expresses itself in us. And the moment we see the first expression of the early church in the book of Acts, that pattern naturally emerges once again. Because you see, I think very often for us, In the modern church, we see something like a small group, a community group, as we call them in Hatfield. You know, to live in real connection with people like that on a weekly basis, it's kind of a nice to have. It's an extra if you really want to take this Christian thing seriously. Like the early church, that wasn't an extra for them. That was just the way they lived life. It was the cardinal way for them of building relationship with Jesus, growing in their relationship with Jesus, and representing Jesus in their life, doing it in community. Listen to this famous passage in Acts 2, 42. It says, of those who accepted the message of Jesus and his good news, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread to prayer, verse 46, and every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. Strong language. They devoted themselves because of what Jesus did in their lives, making them new in the spirit. There was a natural devotion, not just to God, but to one another. You know, our kids, I've, I've, I've said this before, but you know, all of them, still for some of them, they all had this, this deep connection to this little, this, this piece of material that smells nice and it's soft. In Afrikaans, we call it a lappi. And with that, usually a stuffed animal. In fact, Mia, our youngest, she still has that stuffed animal. It's a little elephant that she calls Ellie. And I'm telling you, little Mia doesn't like that lappi and Ellie. She doesn't even love it. She is devoted to those two things. We can't go anywhere without those things. Hell has no fury like Amir 
not connected to her Lappi and her Ellie when she's trying to sleep. But here's the thing. We never taught her those things. We never said to her, be devoted. It was a natural response. Here we see not leaders telling people, be part of this program, get into groups, this is how you have to do. No, we see just the natural emergence of Jesus and his people leads to the people of Jesus. Devotion to God through faith in Jesus leads to devotion to God's people. And there are two amazing, almost ingredients that I see in this pattern of the early church's community. These two beautiful words, regularity and proximity. There was a regularity and a proximity to how they did community. Regularity, every day they devoted themselves coming together. Man, for these guys, they said, Jesus has done such a profound thing in my life. My life cannot just function the same way it used to. I'm going to let everything in my life, my golfing and my CrossFit and my holiday away and, you know, the homework I need to do and the test and this thing and my report and my... All of those things need to shift in alignment with the greater value now of community. They just got together as often as they could. Guys, can I say to us, there's a regularity that builds strong community. We will never have significant Christ-like relationships if we see each other once every couple of weeks. It will never happen. There is a regularity that you need to go and restructure your life around. We only have a couple of decades to represent God on this earth before the new heavens and the new earth awaits. In this season, don't allow other priorities to become your God. There was a regularity, but also, I mean, just think about that. Why would the writers of the Hebrews say, don't neglect to gather together? Because that is the temptation to live alone, to live a mediocre faith on our own. When the invitation is to say, do this together. But with that regularity goes proximity. It says they broke bread from house to house. That's intimate, man. Not just they watched videos online. Not just they were following their favorite American preacher. Not just that they every now and then came to a conference or sat in a row in a building. Listen, I love content. And there are so many great gifts to the church. Preachers from the globe that I listen to on a weekly basis. But guess what? They're not my pastor. And they will never be your pastor. And secondly, I do not have a community with them. That is what I lead the local church for. There's a difference between being blessed by a gift and being entrenched in a community. There's a proximity that I need almost exclusively. Outside of the teaching, Jesus' ministry happened in homes around tables. And so almost all the world religions, you have these holy sites of, of worship, temples and synagogues. And for the early church, you have so little, almost none of these virtually. Why? Because the most powerful expression of the Christian early church was not the temple. It was the table. That is where it happened. Guys, this is us. This is Tina. This is Rona. This is Ons. This is us expressing the pattern of our God in community. But I also think there is a potential that we need to discover for the community that we can have. Verse 24 says, let us consider one another why? To provoke love and good works. That is strong language, friends. To provoke, the writers of the Hebrews says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, love and good works. Community is where we say to one another, I want to see the fullness of what the Holy Spirit has put within you to be developed and to be on display for the world. As a, a programmer, pediatrician, painter, plumber, poet, pastor, preacher, the very best of what God has in you, 24-7 on display, I love you enough to not allow you to live a mediocre Christian faith to get sucked back into the issues of the world, the, the, the you know, concerns of the world, the priorities of the world. No, he says we need to, to provoke the love and the good works of Jesus in one another's lives. So let me give you a couple of these potentials that we have in community. There's the potential that you can experience true discipleship in community. In Hatfield, we always say that discipleship almost has three main elements and ingredients to it. There's the Word of God in the Bible, the Scriptures. There's the Spirit of God in prayer mostly. And then there's the 
people of God. And that's the one that we most like to neglect. You know, people will say, oh, yes, you know, the Bible and it's the scriptures. We need to read and, yes, pray, connecting with God. The people of God, uh, I don't know, when I have time, when, when I don't have to wash my hair, when I have nothing else on my schedule, maybe once every third week. No, I'm missing out then so much of what God wants to do in and through me. Guys, there are more than 50 one another statements in the New Testament. These are commands of, of, the, of the faith. Natural outflow of what it means to serve Jesus. And listen to these things. Love one another. Forgive one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Encourage one another. For, you know, pray for one another. Equip one another. Speak the truth and love to one another. Confess your sins to one another. Greet one another. Live in peace with one another. Be kind to one another. Correct one another. And on and on it goes. How can we do this if we don't live in intentional and close relationship together? God never intended for us to walk as, as lone wolf Christians. It's not his heart. We can experience true discipleship in community. But secondly, in community, the potential is there for us to see true growth in our character. In order to grow spiritually, you need to be connected relation. To grow spiritually, you need to be connected relation. The consumer mentality that the world wants to impress upon you, it's deadly. And you know, it's great when you want to be a consumer, when you have to choose between the three best cell phone contracts to, to save your pocket. But consumer mentality kills the life of the church. When I come into the church saying, what is it offered to me? What service can it give to me? What is in it for me? Versus saying, God, I want to be with your people. Give myself to your people. Be found amongst your people. And I, I realize there's a devotion. There's a commitment to it. There's a beauty even amongst the brokenness. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you yourselves, Paul speaking, know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you. It's so funny. This scripture is almost always used as some kind of defense of, you know, you shouldn't smoke, Johnny, because you're the temple of God. And guess what? I, I guess don't smoke. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. But that's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture in the Greek, the you that is the God's temple, that's the plural, you know, version. It's saying you as the church, you are God's temple. As the guys at the Bible Project would say, it's like the Texas slang. Y'all are the temple of God. That's what that you means. So yes, we need a personal relationship with God through his spirit. I need to hear him and grow in relationship with him and be in step with him and, and receive his love and his comfort and his guidance. I need to be connected on a personal level. But there is an element of communal level relationship that if I don't have that, there, this scripture is saying there's an element of experiencing the Holy Spirit work that I will not fully experience. We need each other to grow in our character and faith. And thirdly, I think there's the potential in community to see people taking steps closer to Jesus. You know, when Jesus had, had one last opportunity to pray before his, his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion, you know what he prayed for? He prayed for his disciples at that moment, but for all future disciples like you and me, followers of Jesus. And he prayed this, John 17, 22. I have given them the glory that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one that the world may know that you have sent me. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying the primary way that the world, who, those who are not yet following Jesus, the friend, neighbor, colleague, family member, who doesn't yet know Jesus, the primary way that they will come to know the love and the truth and the grace of God is not through our buildings or our programs or our outreaches. It's not by coming and just simply sitting in a seat on a Sunday. It is primarily, Jesus says, through seeing the community of God, the love of the people of God, the truth and the grace of the people of God to one another. To have a community that's not perfect in its morals, but is true in its love and worship of God and one another. 
that, he says, will be the convicting element of the world. You know, I have a friend who's just a year older than me. We're in the same school. He's a worship leader today in a church as he works for them in the Western Cape. But when we were at school, one evening, we had this, this kind of big social event with another school. And there was a guy that was really, he had, he had it out for this friend of mine. And he, this, this other guy, he was actually the, the captain of their rugby's first team. So a big burly guy. But at that stage, he was really a bully just in his nature. Many things in his life that had just gone wrong and he was just acting out. And there was this moment, to cut a, a long story short, where this guy just punched this friend of mine in front of girls and, and peers and friends and, and teachers. It was such a bad moment. I know definitely that it's one of the worst and most embarrassing and just degrading moments of his life. But many years later, I sat in our church as a student at the university. And I was in a community group where this friend of mine and this ex-bully sat next to one another because this guy had his life transformed by Jesus in the church, in community. And the two of them sat next to one another in that same group and they became brothers in Christ. This is what the potential of community is. A family that goes on mission. Guys, this is us. Tina, Rona, Ons. There is such a potential and I need to commit to it, devote myself to it. But finally, I do think there is not just a pattern and there is potential, but I do think there's pain that keeps us often from community. And I think we need to address that. We need to speak about it. Uh, you know, I don't think it's by accident that the writer of the Hebrews says in verse 25, don't neglect gathering together, but instead encourage one another. Why would he say that if it was just all easy? It wasn't and it isn't. Today, community is something that the enemy hates. The devil doesn't want us to be connected like this. And I will say it without qualification. There is nothing better for you if you're a Christian in Doxedo Hatfield on a Wednesday evening than community group. I want every single partner of our church to be in a community group. I say it. I don't feel bad about it. I stand by it and I live it. And yet, if I know for a fact that this is what God has for us, why do we still negotiate? Why do we negotiate the value of family, of living in community? We express it primarily in community groups, but it's a bigger value. It's not just a group. It's the value of community. But yet, why do we negotiate even the most basic version of it, just a community group? I think a couple of reasons. I think one is that we must understand what a community group is. I think some of you think, you know, we're going to get together and everyone's just going to cry about their feelings. And especially the men, you're like, I don't want to hold another guy and cry. Um, or you think it's like a glorified AA meeting. And listen, I think the AA is beautiful. It's, it's a God-given gift. But that's what you imagine. We're going to sit down and you're going to be like, hey, I'm Katlejo and I'm a bad sinner. And I watch too much porn and I drink too much. And everyone's going to say, hello, Katlejo. Welcome. And you know, that's, that's not it, guys. Our community groups are built on the value of, of fellowship, community, eating together, having fun, being connected, opening up the Bible, getting into our lives together. These are the people that, that come and change your tire on the highway when, you are, when you're broken down at two in the morning. These are the guys that bring you food when you are sick. These are the guys that celebrate with you and cry with you. Don't simply because you haven't tried something genuinely reject it. I think another reason is just fear of intimacy. Oh, there's that word again. Even, especially again, the men, we like intimacy. Oh, it's not for me. You know, my wife, some of those, those books that she reads uh, with the nice looking men on the cover, there's some words in there like intimacy, but that's not for me. But I want to say, come on, guys. We can be men, <laughs> real men that know our God, our Father, that love Him, that have intimacy with our God and with other people. It takes nothing away from the beer that you're growing or the wood that you're chopping or the oil that you're greasing in your, in your garage. It takes nothing away from that. We need to live in a space of true intimate connection with other people. I think many people think it's uncomfortable, but I also just think many people just don't want to be held accountable. I don't want people to ask me about money and sex and my, my life and my habits because that's my stuff. But friends, we need to choose. I can choose isolation or I can choose growth. 
I can choose accountability or I can choose stagnation, but I can't have both of those things. We need to open up. I think some of us would just say, I just don't have the time. I'm just too busy, it's too much, I can't do this. Now, I know there are seasons, I know there are difficult places we find ourselves in, but I wanna say like Andy Stanley, he always would say, friend, you are too busy not to be in a community group. That's the truth. The world is gonna smush you with all of its values, all of its patterns. You're gonna invest so much time without even thinking in conversations and Netflix and series and movies and music and politics and the news. And before you know it, your faith is going to be so severely, so immaturely just squished into nothingness. No, we are too busy not to be in community. We need to commit to it. We need to say, listen, the CrossFit and the work and the presentation and the homework and the test and the hair washing and the you know, jogging and the, the biking and the dogs, and they need to wait. They need to arrange themselves now around the higher value. Those things are great, but I cannot walk it alone. Maybe it's bad experiences in the past. Maybe you got hurt, offended. Someone really, really did not treat you well. Maybe the group... This didn't work, just wasn't effective. Guys, but I wanna say we cannot toss the value away because we are not always executing it perfectly. People will be imperfect. Groups, individual groups will be imperfect. Situations will be handled imperfectly. But I don't throw away the value of community. Guys, I've had some terrible meals in my life. I've had some, some bad eggs in an omelet, but it doesn't mean that I chuck the value of eating. I hold on to what the good of this is, even if sometimes it's executed imperfectly. Give it another shot. Join a community group. Or maybe just finally, you say it's, it's comfort. You know, ultimately, if I'm honest with my heart, church and faith and all of that, it's basically what, you know, what fits my lifestyle. But I wanna encourage us, friends, we are called by a man who picked up a cross and who called us to pick up our cross, follow him, wash feet, die to ourselves. There's, a, there's an effortlessness to Jesus. He makes us light, free, hopeful. But he also says to us, it's a freedom to, not a freedom just from. Freedom to not be shackled by my comfort. It's a freedom to step into community. You know, I'll end off Many years ago, I found myself on a golf course with some old friends and I don't play golf because I suck at golf. And I'm so thankful my, my golf bag actually got stolen <laughs> at one stage. And I think it's tragedy for the golfers out there. But for me, it was a sigh of relief because I suck at golf. And I told the guys, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll carry the bag. So we're walking and typically like it is with golf, it became this kind of deep conversation as we were playing. And I remember myself just at one stage voicing, just saying, I feel actually so alone at this point. And the strange thing is I was working for the church at that point. You know, I was involved in all of the ministry, the Sundays, the outreaches, the, the courses, the, all of it. I was constantly surrounded by people in every facet of life, hobbies and things and everywhere. But I realized the core element of my world is faith. Faith is not one of the irons in your fire. It is the fire. And because we were not connected, we had done community groups for many years up to that point, but we took a bit of a break. It was, it was two kids and it was post-grad studies and we had another kid had arrived and too many things and work and schedules. We were just too tired and we just couldn't make it work, we felt. But I realized because of that lack of connection to my faith with other people, I was lonely. So you know what we did? We started a new community group. We were living on the University of the Free State campus and we started just with the students kind of in the vicinity. And for the next couple of years, for us as a young family with three kids, we became so endearingly close with those students. I'm telling you, on a Wednesday night, the, you know, the, the crazy you know, the rush hour of getting kids to bed, it's like, it's like Jumanji in there. It's like here's an elephant and there's a monkey swinging and there's like a flamethrower and it's crazy. And, and finally we get the doors closed to the kids. You feel exhausted and the moment that door is closed, the front door flies open. Those students come in there with all their energy and they're like, yay. And I'm like, yay. That's how I felt often. Man, I don't have the energy for this. Often today, I feel like that. On a Wednesday morning, I'm like, I don't have the energy for this today. But you know what? I've never, never, to this day, from then to today, I've never regretted when everyone left and I felt, God, 
thank you. Because this is what we have been made for. Guys, relationship with God leads to relationship with his people. To be brought into a relationship with God is to be brought into relationship with his people. This is us. This is Tina. This is Rona. This is Ons. If you're on this video, click in our description on the link to join one of our community groups. If you're not in a church, that's what you need to do. But for us, as we gather together, this season is one where I want to encourage every single partner of our church. Be in a community group. You will never regret it. I want to pray for you. Jesus, thank you that you create family, true family through your blood and grace that goes on mission together. Will you come and cancel the lies? Will you fight against the offenses? God, will you bring us into a new dimension of what community can be? For your sake, God, and for our city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.